morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along. Uh, we have a very unpredictable panel. Uh, so none of us are quite sure what we're talking about. And we certainly don't know what the others are going to be talking about. But uh, it uh, should be interesting as a result. People from different backgrounds looking at the perspective of China. And of course, we have Liz Perry, who uh, has recently completed a manuscript uh, which builds off the uh, Anyuan uh, workers' movement uh, in the 1920s to explore uh, broader issues of uh, cultural positioning and how the Communist Party thought about organizing, and Liz will start us off. And then one of the, I mean, one of the most interesting things about working on China in recent years is that people who are not uh, what you might consider China specialists have taken an increasing interest and have brought comparative questions, uh, not to say that people like Liz don't have comparative questions, but people like myself have never had a comparative question in my head. So. But one of the exciting things is that people who, uh, you know, look, have different sort of sets of different things and different experiences have been increasingly getting involved in looking at China. I think that's fascinating because it brings a fresh uh, set of eyes. And so Marshall Gantz will then be talking uh, about um, his experience with running this training workshop uh, recently in Beijing and the, the kinds of issues that came up in his mind as a result of that. And then I'll be making up something to say after we hear what they've said and then we'll try and open up uh, for questions. So it's very informal. These are not long formal presentations, and the main purpose is really to raise some questions to get a broader discussion with everybody here going. So let me start first with this. Can you all hear me? This is on. Charismatic revolutionary by the name of Li Li San, 
uh, who had just returned from studies in France, and uh, Mao told Yi Lisan that he was sending him to Arian to mobilize uh, a worker strike. But he cautioned Yi Lisan that he must proceed very carefully because uh, Anyuan was controlled by the Red Gang, the Hongbang, uh, an offshoot of the triads, the Tin Yihui Organized Criminal Secret Society, and that uh, in order to mobilize the workers, Yi San would have to find some way of coping with this organized criminal network. But he should do so under the guise of a school teacher. Yi Li San uh, went to Anyuan uh, as a school teacher. He was actually the perfect choice for this kind of role because his own father was a Confucian scholar in the Ming County, at Xiuzai, the lowest rung of the Confucian examinations. Uh, Li Li San himself had been thoroughly educated in the Chinese classics, and his father had insisted, in fact, that he teach the Chinese classics before he go off to France to learn Western ways. Li Li San took advantage of the fact that his father was good friends with the director of the Chamber of Commerce at Anyan, and the director of the Chamber of Commerce introduced this young uh, communist revolutionary to the magistrate of the county. The magistrate of Pingxiang County was a very conservative old fellow who didn't believe in uh, the use of uh, vernacular Chinese. Bai Ba only believed in using classical Chinese. So Li Li San, in beautiful classical Chinese with beautiful calligraphy, wrote a request to set up a school. Not perhaps our image of how the Chinese Communist Revolution got started. A young revolutionary dressed in a long Chinese scholar's gown writing with his old calligraphic brush in perfect classical Chinese, saying that he wanted to establish a school of why to nurture Confucian virtues among the workers. And the magistrate was so pleased uh, with this idea that he agreed immediately and gave his full support uh, to open this school. Li Jisan first taught the children of the workers by day, but then in the evening, wearing his long scholar's gown, he would visit the of these uh, children and began uh, to talk to them about Marxist-Leninist revolutionary uh, ideas. Uh, in order to organize the workers themselves, Li Li San used a combination of different uh, cultural uh, approaches. As Tony mentioned, I, in my book, talk about what I call cultural positioning, the way in which the early revolutionaries used a variety of cultural resources, drama, religion, ritual, literature, and so forth, uh, in order to present a new radical message in terms that were resonant and familiar uh, to people from that area. All of the early leaders of the Communist Party at Anyang were cultural insiders. They all came from nearby counties in Hunan. They could all speak to both the workers and the local elite in their local dialect and mobilize them on the basis of a shared understanding. Li Li San used not only Confucian uh, cultural material, but also popular cultural material. At the time of the Lantern Festival, which was uh, the occasion in this part of China for uh, massive lantern displays, but also for raucous lion uh, dances. This is a part of China that produces more fireworks, I think, than any uh, other county in China. Uh, so the, these were very loud uh, religious uh, occasions, the Lantern Festival, where those who had martial arts expertise traditionally used to have followers. And Li Li San chose this uh, occasion to have one of his new recruits, who was also a member of the Red Gang, uh, engage in a lion's dance and invite uh, all those who were impressed by his uh, martial arts ability to follow him back to the new school that the new son had set up. But this young uh, lion dancer, who was also a Red Gang member, as I said, when they got back uh, to the school and he had hundreds of young people excited to learn martial arts from him, surprised them by saying, you don't want to study with me, you want to study with the new son. He's the real teacher here. And who is Li Li San's teacher? Who is the ancestral founder of his school? It is an old bearded grandpa, the Lao Puzi Lao who lives far across the ocean, whose name is Ma Qing. 
Karl Marx. And he has taken Karl Marx and also Unkircher uh, in his, uh, as his ancestral founder, and you can follow him. Uh, a few weeks later, on May 1st, uh, Labor Day, uh, Lili San decided to try to recruit large numbers of workers for his new workers club, his new labor union, and he did that by using other religious conventions. It was common, of course, in this area of China, as in most parts of China, during religious uh, temple ceremonies, to carry gods, local patron saints, through the streets on palanquins in sedan chairs. And on this day, uh, Li Li San did that, but the patron saint inside the palanquin, inside the sedan chair, was that bearded grandpa uh, from across the Seven Seas, a little bust of Karl Marx. And if you go to Anyan, I hope all of you who've gone there have gone to the Anyan Labor Museum, and there in the Labor Museum, you can see the little bust of Karl Marx that served uh, as the patron saint for the early uh, communist movement there. When it came time to organize a strike, Lili San realized that maintaining order in this uh, coal mining town would require the support of the Red Gang of the Triad Secret Society. So on a night when Lili San knew that the local chapter of the Hongbang of the Red Gang was planning an initiation ceremony, he went with several of his followers, who were triad members, to the main triad lodge, carrying with him a rooster and a bottle of liquor, which are the main elements of a triad initiation ceremony, and went to the Grand Master of the Anyan Triad Lodge, the dragon head the Lone Poles, who was known, and uh, asked the dragon head for his support for the strike. Dragon Head was very pleased to see that the Sun was honoring him by bringing the traditional materials for an initiation ceremony. Lili San later recalled how he used the vocabulary of the Red Gang that his subordinates had taught him, and the head of the secret society agreed that he would close down his uh, opium dens, close down his gambling halls, close down his brothels during the course of the strike, and would help the communists maintain order. So these are just a few uh, examples of the way in which the very early communist movement used resonant cultural material in order, in order to make what otherwise was a very unfamiliar uh, Bolshevik revolution seem familiar uh, to ordinary Chinese miners. Uh, in the book uh, itself, actually most of the book is about the later uses of this revolutionary tradition, the way in which this history was rewritten and miswritten after 1949 through very different kinds of ends. But I think for those who are interested in uh, uh, social organizing and social movements, going back to the early period of the communist movement and seeing the remarkable way in which Mao, Yi San, later Liu Shaoqi, uh, used resonant cultural material in order to introduce radically new messages as part of construction. Thanks. Great. Questions? organizing 
uh, in that context, a, a tradition of American social movements uh, rooted uh, in part in faith traditions, uh, stories of the Exodus, uh, the sort of, the, sort of the, the moral imperative of people uh, uh, finding the means to free themselves uh, through collective action, uh, rooted in a civic tradition, uh, going back to the, to the Greeks, the idea of self-governance, uh, which is certainly core to the history of this country, rooted in a popular tradition of people discovering that through rent strikes, boycotts, and other means, they could use their resources collectively to assert their interests and, 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 and uh, achieve their goals. Those traditions blended in the civil rights movements in the U.S., and that was what I was uh, introduced to. Um, and after the American Civil Rights Movement, the Farmer Movement, and other uh, movements, and after coming back to school here, then beginning to take a uh, uh, open teaching research perspective on these movements, came up with a, a framework that I used to understand organizing based on my experience and tradition. And what I understand it to be is as a form of leadership. Uh, a form of leadership, uh, however, that isn't rooted in the single leader model, but rather rooted in an idea of enabling others to achieve shared purpose in the face of uncertain conditions. Um, and uh, specifically then, uh, as a way of exercising leadership by developing the leadership of other people, building community around that leadership and building, the, and building power from the resources of that community to transform its conditions and its circumstances of life. So it links individual, collective, and action. And you know, the seminal moment in the American Civil Rights Movement was the Montgomery Bus Boycott, which launched it in 1955, which was organized by the African American community uh, as, a, as an assault on the whole system of segregation. But the particular target were buses that had blacks in the back, whites in the front, um, a no man's land in between, and an armed, deputized bus driver. And so a black person getting on the bus had to go past the armed bus driver, past the white people, find a seat. And if a white person got on, then he had to give up, he or she had to give up his seat to that white person. Uh, and it became a focal point for the challenge to the whole system of racial segregation that's been the person in this country since its founding. Um, and what people discovered, however, was that their success came not through litigation, uh, not, through, not through looking for power up. They found when they looked for power up, nothing came except pats on the head, approval, and saying that they were going too fast. But what they found was they could look down, literally down. And what they found when they looked down, literally down, was they found their feet. And they discovered that a resource for transforming their condition could be their feet. Instead of using their feet to get on the bus, they could use their feet to walk to work and stay off the bus. And if everybody did that together in the whole community, it turned out, as it did, that the bus company was more dependent on the community than the community on the bus company. Learning the powerful lesson about how to generate power from the bottom up, not simply from the top down. But it required learning how to work together, how to collaborate with one another, and how to develop the leadership capacity to do that. That sort of approach and understanding is really what sort of framed my approach to organizing. So uh, uh, in, in the teaching that I do here and the work that I, I do elsewhere, I think of it as, as being built around five core practices. There's the initial practice is the work of translating values into uh, sources of motivation for action through narrative. And I include in narrative, uh, uh, all the expressions that we use, through, whether through ritual or through stories or whatever, that tap into those resources for hope in the face of challenge, for those resources of empathy in the face of alienation, and resources of, of a sense of dignity in the face of, 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 of uh, 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 self-doubt. That the challenge that organizers face then initially is one of how do you how do you, on the one hand, make a challenge real enough that it requires breaking out of habit to respond to? And on the other hand, how do you access the kinds of moral or emotional resources required to be able to act? And, and so that's sort of the first piece. The second is uh, relationship building. The intentional, purposeful building of relationships as public relationships, because those relationships then become the sinews on which the whole organizational effort is created. 
especially if you're an insurgent. And so you're not operating through established institutions. And we don't have to go to ancient history. We can go to the Barack Obama's campaign in 2007 in the United States when the established Democratic Party institutions were mostly supporting his opponent. And the challenge there was to create a new set of organizations that could mobilize voters from scratch, which we did, uh, uh, part of that effort, which we did by building on relational networks, not, uh, not through the internet, but people inviting people they knew to their homes, but on a scale that could create, that could take the natural fabric of social relationships and transform it into an intentional, formal fabric of political organization. That's a lot of what occurred in that setting, so that's the relations piece. Third is uh, strategizing. Uh, the, 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 the insurgent always faces a problem of more resources on the other side. And, and so the, the challenge an insurgent faces is how do I compensate for resources with greater resourcefulness? And, and so I was always drawn to the story of David, the David and Goliath story, which in my tradition is an example of a shepherd confronting a powerful warrior who is able to overcome that warrior, uh, not by using the warrior's tools, but by discovering the tools of the shepherd could in fact defeat a warrior in the form of a stone and a sling went up against. And so the, 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 the significance of, of strategic imagination, of creativity, and of strategy as an ongoing process of learning, not like a five-year plan that then you go implement, but rather a learning that comes through engagement in action, uh, so that it's it's a constant sort of developing. How do I turn what I have, what are my resources, into what I need outcomes to get what I want? Okay, and so how do I turn my resources into the power that I need to get what I want? That's kind of the strategic question. Finally, action. And unless these strategies evolve into clearly measurable actions on the ground whether it's votes or whether it's people coming to meetings or whether it's workers going on strike, it, it, it's meaningful. In other words, it, it becomes meaningful when it begins changing the world, not simply changing my perspective on the world. And that occurs through the deliberate uh, mobilization and deployment of resources, of time, money, people, effort, and all the rest. Finally, it requires developing structure to support those practices. Now you notice I've been mentioning practices of organizing the leadership not so much position or person. Because this is a notion that's rooted in the idea that these practices constitute the exercise of leadership. They can be exercised by different people from different places in different kinds of structures. The kind of structure that, that we've been working with a lot over the last uh, few years has been to depart from the idea of the one single leader who tells everybody what to do, the single dog but also to depart from my generation's reaction to that, which was to say, we want nothing. Uh, all structure is oppressive, and so we just won't have it, which leads to chaos. Uh, and so we've been working at, at the development of a collaborative or interdependent leadership structure uh, based on the whole idea of leadership teams and collaborative leadership. Um, it's a middle ground. It's a cascading model of leadership where the idea is that, that learners become teachers, and so as people acquire leadership practices, they then teach others in those practices. And again, this is the approach we used in the Obama campaign to create leadership teams all across the country, uh, down to very, very local levels that engage people in responsibility for that effort. So, um, so that's kind of the framework with which I approach organizing, think of organizing. But I read Liz's introduction, it blew me away. I said, I know this. I, I loved it because the, the, the attention to, 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 you can put yourself in the position of those people trying to figure out how do we bridge this gap from being elite intellectuals who have this critique of the world and ordinary people without whom the world will not be changed. And they were struggling with that. And I thought they were struggling with, it, with amazing creativity. Uh, I love the cultural stuff. See, in the, in the civil rights movement, you can't imagine the civil rights movement being about manifestos and ideological analyses. You know, the civil rights movement drew its energy out of church. I mean, the, the, the mass meetings, the visions of, of redemption, the, the whole moral force behind it, uh, the idea of fasting, the idea of these were deeply embedded cultural practices through which people could access hope, through which they could create solidarity. Uh, the same thing in the farm workers movement that I've worked in for 16 years. There it was not a Baptist black tradition like in the South, it was a Roman Catholic Mexican tradition. Same sets of resources, including theory, 
including song. We had the Teatro Campesino. Uh, it, it brought in a whole other dimension. And so your focus on the cultural dimension of organizing, I thought, was just great. And, and it, it's far too often ignored because it's where the heart it's where the heart work is done. You know, we focus so much on the head work, being very strategic, but we forget that without the heart, there's no gas. There's nothing to drive to drive things, and nothing nothing will really happen. Uh, I, I, the strategic creativity, the leadership development, all the things that you mentioned, there they were. And so I thought, wow, I'm going to go to China, and it's all going to be very familiar. Well, <laughs> not exactly. No, but it, but it both inspired me, and it also filled me. What? I'm going to go to Beijing. I'm going to teach something about organizing. Give me a break. I mean, uh, if there's ever a country that had experience with both, both, both the angels and the demons associated with popular mobilization and organization, I was China. And so, uh, I, I, so I went more with an intent of learning than anything else. Uh, and it turned out to be an incredible opportunity. Um, I, uh, uh, with uh, Bang Wei's help and the Serena's help, uh, they trained a team of, ten, of eight uh, uh, coaches of uh, Beida students who became our team leaders. We worked with, for four days with 64 NGO leaders in teams of eight each and worked through each of these practices systematically, storytelling, relationship building, structure, strategy, and action. And at the end, they all came up with strategic visions and calls to action uh, of what they what they were I was told all these stereotypes. Um, we don't uh, do emotion here in China. Uh, we don't talk about ourselves. Well, that lasted about five minutes. I, I, I really, and it's and it's very resonant with my experience in the in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, where I've also done work within this framework. Not that they're the same, but I realized that what this framework is is not so much about some harder theory, but actually it's about how we do this stuff. And a lot of it we do implicitly. And a lot of what the framework does is draw the implicit and make it explicit so we can be more intentional about how we go about doing it. Do people tell stories in China? Uh -huh. Yeah. Do people tell stories about themselves? It turns out they were very powerful storytellers about their own sources of motivation when authorized to do so, when it was okay. And what we found was when the stories began to get told, the values were experienced to share. That in turn fueled a kind of, a kind of creative energy that is really uh, unlike any I had seen in the workshop. As we did the relational work, the structure, forming a shared purpose is one of the little things we do is when you form a team and you articulate your shared purpose, you have to do the chant, you know, come up with a chant uh, to make it sort of fun. Well, we had songs and dance and uh, visual presentation. Uh, it, it was amazing, but then when it got to doing the strategic work, it was powerfully creative because it was okay, it was allowed. You could, you could post crazy ideas, work them through, uh, and then leading to action. So, like I say, the combination of creativity, humor, uh, and uh, one of our teams named itself the Love Gas Station. That's it. I'll great, <laughs> I run through some of the names. They're wonderful. They're, they're wonderful. But the combination of creativity, humor, and discipline that, that we experienced in that workshop was, to me, very exciting. <clears throat> As was the work of the young people, the students who coached uh, the, the older Workshops. The Beidou students who, uh, boy, they took to this stuff and just became very, very skilled. I was worried about age differences and all that, but we seemed to work right through that. So we, we had a terrific experience. We, um, you know, made a video uh, of it, a, a tape, you know, a, a slideshow and all the rest. But of course, the question then that I wanted to briefly bring to Tony and with Liz, when I come back, we haven't yet, is, okay, so what does all this mean? I mean, the response to what we had to offer was tremendous, but that often happens in trainings. You know, people are excited, there's a glow, and then usually they go back to normal life, and then it goes away. And so the real question is, what sorts of structures are created that this actually plays into? And I just want to make two observations. Um, well, three, actually. <laughs> That's it, three. Uh, no, first, I want to say something about the internet, because this was conceived as a joint online, offline workshop at the uh, Berkman Center uh, on Internet and Society. Colin McClay uh, worked with us there along with uh, Dr. Zhang and Dr. Shear uh, at, at uh, Beida in putting this thing uh, together. And I hadn't realized before going, I mean, I understand the internet, we work over the internet here, it's, it's had a big impact on mobilizing, if not organizing. 
mean, I think there's an important distinction. I think the, the uh, in, in, in the Arab world, it's, it's being discovered that the mechanism of mobilization is not the same thing as the mechanism required for organization to win elections. Uh, and the young people who have had that experience have been learning about the difference between the two. Uh, but what I seem to understand in China was that a horizontal public space like this simply hasn't existed before. And the creation of that horizontal public space seemed to be incredibly significant. Uh, not because the internet does things by itself, it's a tool. And it takes skilled carpenters to use a hammer to build a house. Hammers don't build houses no matter how fancy they are by themselves. But it creates a venue which impossibilities emerge that I, I, I just never appreciated how significant uh, it was. The, the concept that our, our team struggled with the most was the concept of constituency. A lot of the people we were working with were uh, engaged in charitable work. Uh, beneficiaries uh, made sense. Constituency was a struggle to get, oh, a constituency. That's the people with the problem that we're organizing to solve the problem. Well, obviously, that's a politically very challenging notion. Uh, and so it was just interesting to see the, sort of see the, the back and forth around that. And of course, we had people say things like, well, I'm doing a, a literacy campaign, but really what we're doing is developing civic leadership. And I got the sense that there's like at least two or three levels to what's going on in, uh, at any one time. Uh, and, and that what needs the eye is uh, only a, a glimmer of the reality underneath. And that's the third thing. I, it developed a real interest and appetite in me to figure out how to support and nurture uh, this emerging generation. One of our students said, the generation of the 90s dove into the sea of business. We're, we're busy jumping over the wall. Uh, and uh, I really appreciated that because it, it, it created this spirit of exploration, creativity, and innovation. That if it can be brought to the social sector and to the problems of inequality, and stratification and all the rest of it could be a powerful, powerful source of hope and change. Thank you. Um, okay, I have um, a few comments. Um, four general comments and then two specific comments uh, to Marshall. And I think two of my general comments refer both to what Liz was talking about and what Marshall was talking about. The first thing I want to say, though, is a little bit more specific, because uh, it follows on really from where Liz left off the story of organizing. And I just want to make some comments, actually, that despite the official interpretations that uh, Liz covers well in her book, the reality was that uh, uh, Mao actually was quite disillusioned with the revolutionary potential of the proletariat in Anyuan and subsequently. And that marked his shift to a strategy which uh, allowed him to want to work with the nationalist group, the Guomindang, and also refocus energy subsequently on the peasantry. Because shortly after the Anyuan strikes and a number of other strikes in the latter part of 19. 22, there was an incredible enthusiasm amongst the young communist leaders that a proletarian revolution was actually possible in China. Uh, Tsai He Sen, who was an early communist, he criticized what he called some comrades in the party who no longer recognized the need to pass through the phase of national revolution until the proletarian revolution could come immediately. That led to a huge crushing uh, of the workers' movement in the north of China, which then rippled out. And although uh, the Anyuan area and also Hunan was spared from a lot of that crackdown, Mao, in contrast to later official accounts, was not optimistic about the revolutionary potential, even in Hunan. He said students could only be aroused by patriotism, and related to what uh, Liz was talking about, new forms of education, he stressed. For workers, the dominant interest was improving living standards, and they had very little political interests. The peasantry had no interest in public life or political questions at all. And he said the number of workers you could organize in a modern way was only 30,000 out of 3 million. 30,000, of course, was the number that they actually organized under the Hunan Labor Federation. 
So he was in a very pessimistic mood. Uh, he felt that the old tradition of a patriarchal society was very strong. This prevented the development of a modern mass party. So he said, if you take away the military from the Guomindang, you have nothing. You just have the name of a party. Uh, what was important for Mao, I think this is interesting given that he's seen as uh, the person who merged these theories into a Chinese reality. Uh, Mao said that what was important was neither class organization nor mass action, but the action of the foreign powers. He said what the Chinese movement needed most was the active diplomatic and military support from Russia, with a military force to be established in the northwest of China. And according to uh, the commenter and agent there, a Dutchman called Snafley, Mao was so fed up with labor organization and was so pessimistic that he saw the only salvation for China coming from invasion by Soviet Russia. Bourgeois revolution was impossible, so there was no harm actually in joining the KMT because it didn't matter too much one way or the other. And China would only uh, have its revolution after the world revolution succeeded in overthrowing the capitalist class in the capitalist countries. So uh, we see a very different Mao there from what is sort of pictured in this heroic narrative and the disillusionment before he rebounds and gets into organizing in the countryside and the story that we know. Let me just make then three more, more general points. I think that one of the very interesting things from Liz's work is that the case of Anyuan and then the subsequent failure in the North confirms the view that the Chinese Communist Party was successful in those areas where its cadres or its officials understood the local environment and where they were good at micro-politics. And I think that's what comes over strongly, and Marshall said as well, that the use of these traditional symbols uh, to mobilize and to get support. Of course, it could also work against them. Many of those people who fell out of favor with the Communist Party, Yi Li San, Zhang Wotao later, had precisely those strategies of using tradition and accommodation to local interests used against them. Zhang Wotao also, uh, in his base area, worked with local bandits and local gangs and so on and so forth to, to establish a successful base. But of course, once he fell out of favor, that was all used against him as some of these accusations which were made in the Cultural Revolution. But I think the important point that comes out of, of Liz's um, at work is this it worked where they understood the local environment. Uh, in part, of course, that sensitivity to the locality was reinforced by the simple need to survive. They couldn't be so ideological. And if you look where the Communist Party was less successful in organizing, it was where it tried to impose an ideological derived strategy and tactics on a particular place. And that's where they tended to fail uh, before 1949. It often led to alienation in the locality and by re to rejection uh, by the local population. So what then changes? Uh, Liz goes into a lot of this in the book, but obviously for time didn't talk about it today. In my view, what happened was that after the Chinese Communists seized power after 1949, senior party leaders no longer felt the need to negotiate with other groups and social forces. And when, par when party members thought about the lessons of the revolution, it was increasingly in terms of a myth that had been created uh, by the party and by the propaganda apparatus, which portrayed the Chinese Communist Party riding or surfing to power on this massive wave of popular peasant support. And the party leadership through that process became increasingly divorced from the everyday realities of politics and organization. And I think decision-making, therefore, began to suffer. The third point I want to make, and this, this really is very true what Marshall said. You see all of these in Liz's books, and you see all of these in Mao. Mao, Mao's work was extraordinary as an organizer, no matter what happened after 1949. The one feature that's, that strikes me most about Mao before 1949 is that he was a master storyteller. He told a narrative that people could buy into. And he told a narrative in a way that linked individual histories to what seemed to be a bigger trajectory that the world was going. So, you know, I, you know, I was a, you know, a liberal intellectual and I was persecuted. I fled to the base area. You know, my house was burned out 
by the Guomindang or the Japanese forces. And I fled to Yan'an. And what Mao did was he told a story. That's not you, just you as an individual. You are part of the major historical flow here of the colonial invasion, of the remnants of feudalism. And what is the way out of that? The way out of that is that the Communist Party understands that past and it can lead a trajectory through our narrative into the future. Because just think about it, the base area they were in was ridiculous. It was tiny, it had very little resources, and it was surrounded by a sea of hostility. And the brilliant thing that Mao did in organizing was he made it seem as if the base area was rational. He turned the world upside down. It was the world outside that was irrational and crazy. And he built this phenomenal organization, of course, with a lot of brutality for those who didn't agree with his viewpoint. But it wasn't pure brutality. It was narrative, it was storytelling, it was organization that both Liz and Marshall had talked about. And this then touches on the question of the power of radical ideas and the mobilization of political movements. Because through that intertwining of events and ideas, people reinterpreted their circumstances. And on occasion, as they did with Mao, they came through to change them through revolutionary political action. And Mao was crucial, as I said, in facilitating that, that process. Um, he was in a generation of political thinkers with cosmocratic impulses, Lenin, Trotsky, and Gandhi, so on and so forth. And he had a remarkable ability to turn ideas into action. He weaved a narrative, as I said, from those terrible conditions and uh, situation. The myths, the stories, the texts, the logical prescriptions, many of which drew both on uh, Chinese tradition, but also weaved in you know, Grand Uncle Marx and Grand Uncle Lenin and so forth into those stories. And was, as I said, was able to link those individual tragedies to a grand sweep of a narrative about Chinese history. But the fourth general point, which I think Marshall raised, is absolutely crucial. If you think how the Chinese Communist Party organized, it's vertical and it's cellular. And it tries to stop flow across those vertical boundaries. One of the big fears we had in 1989 with the student demonstrations was that the students didn't go up and down, so the Peking University students didn't go up to the Peking Municipal Student Federation and so on and so forth. They organized horizontally. The Workers' Autonomous Federation, although small, began to do the same thing. They didn't want to go through those official vertical structures. Now what you've had in the reform period is two ways of this horizontal coordination. The first is markets. You know, markets are coordinating China in a horizontal fashion, linking across these vertical boundaries. And I didn't, I actually didn't think particularly um, that the internet could be such a powerful force. But I'm beginning to rethink that because it is also cutting across those vertical boundaries. It's allowing information flows, connectivity, organization to work which is quite antithetical to the way that the Communist Party finished up trying to organize its society. Now, I'm not saying this is going to lead to massive change, overthrow, or whatever, but it, I think it's the biggest challenge to the Communist Party for its continued rule in, in the future. So those are my four general points. The two specific questions I have, and I'll turn to Marshall, and I think it relates back to Liz's work, is that given Liz's work and the depth and the things she talked about, how does what you were doing actually really translate into viable strategies in China? Because as you said, your, your background you know, came out of uh, a tradition of movements. Now you distilled five things which you kind of said you thought worked yeah. in that situation. But I also want to leak it to my second specific question. And that is that NGOs in China basically spend all their time or most of their time portraying themselves as status quo supporters and is not, you know, for obvious reasons, right. is not trying to overthrow it. Yet a lot of the words and a lot of the phrases you use were turning over, upturning, you know, the marginalized coming through, so on and so forth. So I'd like to start with those sort of two questions, one which relates back to Liz, where that early organizing was deeply embedded in traditional practices. And secondly, how does it translate with a set of organizations which are desperately trying to show themselves as supportive of the regime rather than taking the regime on? Oh, well, the answer, no. 
<laughs> no, I mean, this is, the, this is precisely the question, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember in the, in the book, uh, in that Mao's Invisible Hand book, this was edited, a collection of very interesting essays, uh, there's this sort of surface to point uh, way of uh, experimentation and then from experimentation you draw conclusions that can then be applied. I mean, it, it, I think the only way that an answer is discovered to your question is through experimentation. Mm -hmm. And what was energizing to us in this workshop was we felt the spirit of experimentation, uh, especially with the younger people. I mean, I just have this image in my mind of like uh, working to block, you know, internet and stuff. And then there's millions of young people. How do we get around it? How do we get around it? And they can't keep up. I mean, it's like, like my kids when I put on parental blocks. No, <laughs> yeah. well, there you go. But it, it provides then a tool of horizontal connection, but also a, a tool for experimentation and exploration, which isn't in distinction from organizing on the ground. It actually facilitated, I think, contribute to it. I don't know. I, 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 think, I think that's a important question. What I was impressed with was the appetite and the interest in experimenting with tools. That And, and does this work? Does this not work? Let's try this. Let's try that. That kind of... Uh, Experimentation, I think, is how they how they measure these things. On the second part about the NGOs, I mean, NGOs generally have two faces. I mean, you know, NGOs. There's the NGO as, you know, we so, we sort of are here to make neoliberalism comfortable. In other words, we're here to take the burden off the government. We're here to reduce the burden on taxpayers. We're here to provide social services to people. On and on and on, which is fundamentally a profoundly status quo uh, orientation. But then they also have this other character as civic associations, as community organizations, as mechanisms of organization. In the US, the, the, the real tradition of civil associationism was not the NGO firm or foundation. It was the association. It was people associating with one another horizontally, and through that, developing broader understandings of common interest and access to common resources. And until the late 19th century, that was the major form of civic association in the United States. The corporation then developed a, a form of mass, a massive top-down control as opposed to voice, which then became much more of a model for subsequent social service agencies and all the rest. So there's, I think there's a dual character. But I think that, that innovative actors, like Billy Sai, I really liked in that story, uh, innovative actors, uh, organizers, so forth, I think figure out how to operate to do this sort of undercover in that. I mean, you know, I don't know, but I mean, it's sort of like, where do you create the spaces for experimentation? Uh, and I certainly sense that there was a fair amount of that going on. But I, I think that's a crucial distinction. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things that interests me is, if you look at Taiwan, in the period when you only had the Kuomintang and a relatively authoritarian regime, if you wanted to get political training, you could either join the party, yeah. which many people did, or didn't necessarily agree with the party, which you had in China at the kind of time. Or what were the alternative mechanisms? And if you look at Taiwan, a lot of the opposition movement grew out of NGOs working on women's issues, uh, the environment, and consumer advocacy. Because it was very hard for a regime to care, we don't give a shit about women, we don't mind if you live in a shit. Just a Republican. <laughs> you know, we don't care if you live in shit, and we don't care if your, you know, your refrigerator blows up in your face. So they did actually become alternative modes and nexuses for people to learn organizational exactly. skills, which later did get transferred into the political sphere. Phyllis, did you have any initial um, comments? And then I think we'll open up. Okay, let me just, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to hear that Marshall is another one of the illustrious Harvard dropouts. Uh, <laughs> to write a book, you know, because Bill Gates. But also uh, Bill Hinton, uh, yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but William Hinton, whose uh, book Fan Shan is probably oh. the most riveting yeah, and detailed of story of yeah. the way in which the communists mobilized for land reform. And Bill Hinton was also a Harvard dropout when I asked him This how, is not advice to uh, <laughs> <laughs> the room, by yes, When I asked Bill <laughs> to write so beautifully, it really is an extraordinarily beautiful narrative, he said, well, it was his creative writing. So we got something before he dropped out. I just picking up this question of you know what is and what isn't transferable from one context to another. I think is a very interesting one. And I used to be of the belief that these kinds of practices were pretty trans 
portable around the world and so forth. All people are kind of similar and so forth. Um, but when I was doing research on the Shanghai labor movement, I was very intrigued with a strike that took place, I think it was in 1946, right after the Second World War, that the communist underground in Shanghai helped to organize. And they called this form of strike a fa qing ke, a grand invocation. This was a strike not quite like the Montgomery bus uh, boycott, but it was aimed at the trolley cars, the street cars in Shanghai. At that time, it was illegal um, to carry out strikes in public utilities. So what the leaders of that strike very cleverly did was say, OK, the, the streetcars will continue to run, but we just won't charge anybody for tickets. This will be a cheap club. Cheap club, you know, cheap club OK? So uh, the conductor, who usually was very rude to passengers, instead says, well, well, this was very, very expensive, right? Because the company still had to pay for the electricity. It still had to pay the wages for the drivers and the conductors and so on. And it was immensely popular. Shanghai, and then it spread to department stores and all kinds of service industries. And I thought, what a brilliant technique. <coughs> and then I just happened to come across a story that the same technique had been applied a couple of months before in the, on the electric train in Yokohama in Japan. And it was a complete disaster, a complete flop. Why would that be? Of course, Japanese are too polite to get on without buying a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, that's right. Um, but it makes you realize that these kinds of techniques also have to be culturally resonant in some way or another. And I think it is a real challenge to organizers to think about what kinds of things excite people and are really successful, and what kinds of things uh, are true. No, I think that's so true. And, and one of the important things of starting with narrative is that it roots, it roots what's happening in people's own cultures, identities, and traditions. So instead of being sort of an alien infusion, it's a question of like, where's the growth sources here? And um, you know, it, 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 I'm so, I mean, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely right. But I think then, and, and there are, there's no like foregone conclusion. I thought what you said was very interesting about the party trying to impose this ideological. So it's like going, it's like there was an old organizer from the AFL CIO that came to train us when we were doing organizing for farmers. He said, You got all your theories and a lot of stuff's really great, but let me just tell you, nothing beats sticking close to the people. And and the truth in that statement is see, that is where the, the root of, of effective organizing is. It's not theorizing about the people, it is about engaging with the people. And of course, people's cultural understanding of who they are and where they are in the world is fundamental. So I, you know, I couldn't agree more. I think the question of tactical transfers and so forth is all a question of experimentation. I mean, uh, but it's just one of the things I was saying. You know, we were looking for in the way we teach narrative. We have the story of your own calling, the story of our calling, the story of challenge, the self us kind of thing. And we couldn't find a good model for story of self until we found what you told us about uh, Snow's interview with Mao uh, in, in Rich Hart. There's actually an interview where he, he challenges him to go back to his parents, how he grew up. And, and the way uh, Snow describes it is everybody gathered around because they'd never heard that story. They'd heard the story of the official party thing, mm -hmm. but they never heard about the person, which I thought was really, really yeah. interesting. Uh, and it's a unique kind of source that uh, uh, there is. Really. So let's open up for questions uh, or comments. Yes. Let us know who you are as well. Uh,
Yeah, no, I think that's a very valid point. That, uh, you know, there's no doubt that the elections, you know, formed a point about around which different opinions and groups could organize. And yeah, for sure. I mean, if you look at uh, South Korea, or if you look at uh, Japan's development, uh, um, Taiwan's development, although they're all very different, and they've all maintained very strong elements of their own cultures, uh, the US played an incredibly significant uh, part in the development, uh, whether it's in terms of economic aid, whether it's in terms of <coughs> trade links going, or you know, voices around human rights and, and political pressure. It's very valid. Other questions? Yes, this lady here. Well, basically, uh, her work is on um, uh, groups which are working with the informal labor sector in contemporary China. And what she was struck with by Liz's uh, accounts was that they also use a, a variety uh, of different mechanisms, in including performance arts and theater uh, presentations at construction sites uh, to gain credibility and to be able to work with the organizations. Oh, sorry, to work with the informal labor group. Yes, I'm not sure. Well, it was just interesting, your, your comment, because we certainly saw that in the workshop. I mean, we saw that kind of song and performance and all that. It, it was great. This is more of a question of, given the, the mobilizing techniques used in the cultural revolution, the language of mobilization, campaign, I was thinking then of dance, you know, like, has that language been poisoned? I mean, in other words, is that so associated with deeply negative experience that popular mobilization is seen as a pathway to chaos. I, I don't know, this is a question. I don't know. What you said suggests not so. Liz, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting question. You know, actually that word, Ian Dong, um, we have a, someone here at Harvard in the History Department who recently has done a dissertation on um, the discourse surrounding elections from the late imperial period through the early PRC period. And in uh, the late imperial period and the early republican period, as elections were just coming into vogue, uh, this term, Yun Dong, an electoral campaign, was used very, very negatively by people. And in the editorials and newspapers and so on, you talked about that. It, it was uh, unpleasant because it was people publicly showing their conflicts and disagreements and so forth. And one of the things that really interested me in reading that dissertation is how that term then turns into the positive valence of the Mao period. And then wondering, again, the question that you just raised as to whether it's going to flip uh, back. You know, during the Mao's period, people often referred negatively to activists as Yindongyuan, athletes, which is the same word for athletes, but they would see a kind of sport of here comes the next campaign and let me you know, be the activist ahead of the curb to curry favor with the party authorities and get some extra points and so forth. I think, in fact, a very interesting study could be done of the meaning of that term in modern Chinese history and the way it's taken on positive and negative valences. But that is to say, I don't really 
really know the answer to your question. Now, it is used for a number of different kinds of things. And of course, there is a lot of negative feeling about the struggle campaigns of the Mao period. But I think it's important to remember that the Mao period had hundreds of campaigns that weren't political struggle campaigns. There were also campaigns against cystosomiasis, campaigns against uh, uh, flies and rats and so forth that created a revolution in public health, in fact, you know, that were very, very important. Campaigns of barefoot doctors being sent down, literacy campaigns and so forth. So there were a lot of practical, you know, developmental campaigns um, that also were used on alongside these political struggle uh, campaigns. Yeah, I think uh, one thing I'd just add to that, the language of the Chinese Communist Party is very brutal language. Whereas, you know, the language of Marxism, a lot of it is about class and class struggle. The language of the Chinese Communist Party is about war. You know, yes, it's Yundong, but usually you're, wa you're waging a you know, a war on this, and it's a war on nature, it's a war on SARS, it's a war on something else. So there's a real brutality in the, in the language that the party has adopted. And I think that also fed into the brutality of victims at uh, different points. And of course, the way it's been used by the current leadership, not just the last two weeks for standing, has been very much um, as a warning, you know, to stop people asking for more liberty and greater freedoms because you, know, you might get this kind of chaotic outcome of the Cultural Revolution. So it's been very beneficial uh, for them to portray that. There's a gentleman Thank you. Yes. Uh, my name is Daniel. Maybe a bit louder so as other people can hear. Uh, yes, Samuel from UMass Boston, and a uh, question for um, Professor Gans. Um, at the outset, you described the 60s movement in America that had a confluence of uh, religious, um, popular, and civic you know, traditions. I was wondering if you have observed any contemporary religious um, resources in China. Uh, it's estimated that there are you know, more than the Communist Party members. Has there anyone, has there been anyone in China that's trying to use religious resources in both the narrative as well as the relationship building in, in organizing religion? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I was there for a week. <laughs> so, yeah, that's long enough to be an I, I do know that within our workshop, there were certainly people who articulated their sources of motivation, some as, as more general, broadly humanistic, some as specifically religious. <coughs> Christian. Uh, I mean, there was some articulation in that in that, uh, in, the, in that language. That, you know, to comment beyond my little window of observation, I won't be. <laughs> but it's a great question. If you're an economist, if you're weak in country, you go to both You don't have to go to a country at all. <laughs> no, <it's really laughs> um, well, when you said. Uh, are there people using religion for these purposes? There, of course, are lots of people using religion to mobilize for religious purposes, um, including, what, 20,000 or some incredible number of South Korean missionaries who are in China um, mobilizing all over the place, um, and all different varieties. There's a very interesting book uh, by Cao Nanlai of Hong Kong University that's called Constructing Chinese New Jerusalem. It's about the city of Wenzhou, where uh, if you travel around Wenzhou, it's extraordinary uh, how um, prevalent the so-called underground uh, churches are. They're everywhere. And also, people have up on the outside of their homes um, posters identifying themselves as members of the Catholic uh, Church there. Again, a mobilization strategy. When I visited Wenzhou, I met with a number of the uh, Catholic leaders there who were talking about how they had developed that strategy to make it um, very public that people uh, were Catholic in order to attempt to recruit more to the Catholic faith. Um, but, um, but in terms of using uh, religious kinds of tropes for other more subversive but uh, a-religious kinds of means, uh, I guess I'm not so aware of that. The gentleman in the back. I'm a religious scholar in Harvard Law School and researching the uh, conflict between state law and the customary law of minorities. And 
question is about um, the, the recent leftist movement in China. It's not necessary that an NGO movement is initiated um, by uh, the neo, uh, uh, neo leftist or neo Maoist. Uh, and what should I try to say from the center? So mm -hmm. I just want to know uh, what your comments are. Uh, can I just start? Can I have a question? Thanks. I was just wondering if you could define kind of from an academic perspective the difference, or maybe there is no difference, between mobilization and organization against a, a in contestation of, for change and civil society. So um, Professor Gibbs was talking about how uh, his history in mobilizing in the United States against things, like against segregation, and then conducting a workshop in China with organizations that sounds like are like a rotary club, like not necessarily trying to contest anything. And I'm wondering if it, in the, both in the literature and in practice, is there, a di is there, do we differentiate between these things or do you use one, employ one to try to impact the other or kind of give any insights on that? Okay, Liz and Marshall, do you want to make some further points? I'm sorry, there's a couple of other hands that came up later, but uh, we were very tight on time. Uh, well, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, on the, the question of um, Bo Xilai and the, the princelings, uh, you know, obviously the last couple of weeks uh, have uh, suggested that maybe that uh, model of, uh, of neo-leftism is not going to have the hearing that we thought it was going to have at the central levels. Um, but I think you know, this is a real issue for the so-called princelings for that generation um, who really owes their position to their parents' revolutionary activities. Um, you know, under those circumstances, what legitimacy do they have to be in political office? Their legitimacy derives from their connection uh, through their family to the revolution. And so, you know, it's quite understandable that that group, that you would have an alliance between someone like Liu Shaoqi's son and uh, Bui Mo's son, even though their parents were not on such great terms. Nevertheless, all of them uh, have a connection back to, to the revolution. So, you know, I think you do have that. Um, but you have many different strains. So you have the princelings for their particular self-interest, perhaps, claiming this revolutionary connection. You have a group of intellectuals, many of whom have American PhDs. Um, who are advocates of neo-leftism, which they see as representing some of the ideals of the revolution that have been lost in the corruption of market reform. But then you also have um, 
social groups. So that if you go to Anyan and you ask uh, elderly miners, or often even younger miners in Anyan, they will also give you a very positive view of the Cultural Revolution. Often they think of the whole Maoist period as being the Cultural Revolution. Um, and talk about it as though it's all an undifferentiated period in which the working class was in charge uh, and they had great status and great um, uh, uh, protections and security that have been lost in the post time period. So I think you know there are many different groups uh, in China for very, very different reasons who find uh, something uh, to rescue, if you will, from the Chinese revolutionary tradition for really quite different purposes. And I think this is going to be a very conflictual and contested debate for a long period of, of time. Uh, you know, we have this problem in the United States to a much lesser extent, but the whole Tea Party movement in the United States is also an expression of the, the fact that the American revolutionary tradition remains contested as well. So you have groups claiming to be the rightful inheritors to the Boston Tea Party, to the American Revolution, get the federal government out of our lives, and others who don't believe that that's the most important message of the American Revolution. And I think any revolutionary society has to work out what the meaning of that revolution is for the contemporary period. And in China, I think it's a particularly difficult and um, conflictual process. Okay. Yeah. challenges sometimes that's required. So there's a kind of a pain side to this whole thing. But then there's the hope side, because without that, they don't mobilize either. Uh, people then just become passive or despairing or resign themselves to it. A lot of organizers make that mistake big time. And just by talking about how bad things are, people are going to act. It's, it's, it's just the opposite. Navigating that, that tension, creating the tension, creating the tension, because I mean, my view is that change occurs through tension. Without tension, nothing happens. And so the question is whether the tension is constructive or destructive tension. And so creating that tension and then harnessing it to action is a lot of what organizers do. Uh, and so the insider-outsider, yeah, you want to have intimate knowledge of the need for change. But you also want to be able to conceive change being possible. And see, it's that range of possibility. So someone like Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, insider-outsider, I don't know, his a PhD here at, at Boston University, compared to working on a plantation in Mississippi. Um, outsider, black, insider. And, and understanding that duality of identity as a creative source, I think is really crucial to understanding how social media is work. And, and that it's never just all inside. And it can't be just outside, which is one of the problems with the coming video, by the way, which is that I don't see how it engages with the inside actors. I mean, that to me is what is a piece that's kind of left unclear to them. In terms of ideology and so forth, I think there's a difference between values and I, I understand ideology to be uh, a, a systematic framework for both analyzing and valuing the world. And I got my picture, this is how it works, come here and drink my ideology. I think the values is being quite different, but rather they're, they're, they're more of emotional commitments toward things like equality, uh, uh, empathy, connectedness, community, uh, dignity, worth, and they play out in many, many different kinds of ways and with many different kinds of strategies. Now, a, a, an organizer can't tap into the power of values because values are essentially emotional commitments. I mean, the language of values is emotion. It's not your reason about your values. Your values, it, you, there's a different reasoning process that goes on with values, and we do a lot of that work through story. 
an organizer that doesn't understand that, that there's a dialogue in both emotion and reason required. There's a, there's a dialogue in motivation and in analysis. There's why we're doing what we do and how we're going to do it. And both have to play a role. Without that, nothing happens. It's either just all ideas or it's all just random commitment that it doesn't translate into action. I don't think that's about ideology. That's more about understanding values and understanding strategy and being adaptive in how you understand that given both the circumstances. Uh, yeah, actually, I think Mao, in his writings, picks up on this question of tensions. He calls them contradictions, but he goes all the way through his work. On the, I mean, I wouldn't really give Kusin a chance to say something before we all run off, but let me just say one thing on the following up on what Liz was saying about um, human dignity and the, the groups which are uh, feeling left out with reforms. I think Wang Hui, the uh, Tsinghua academic now, writes quite eloquently on that. And in one of his writings, he talks about why people became disillusioned with liberalism amongst his set of intellectuals in China. And it was in part because he said the promises were never fulfilled. We were told if we took a liberal approach to the economy, if we followed a liberal uh, script, you know, we'd get open fairness, we get a well-rounded and developed society. And he says what we got by contrast is tremendous corruption, inequality, so on and so forth. So he said, you know, most of the people around him therefore became disillusioned with the idea of liberalism and turned to these kind of more statist, neo-leftist ideas to address that. Of course, the liberals then say, well, you've got all these problems because we never followed the liberal agenda through to its end. We got this sort of half world where rent-seeking was feasible, where corruption was possible, and we still had those kinds of uh, potential for insider trading, secrets, so on and so forth, swapping of information. But, uh, Hussein, do you want to just have a final word before we finish up? Hi, my name is Xing Fu. I manage the nonprofit in China program. That's a sponsor of this center. So first of all, let's give another applause. in late August at Harvard is a week-long workshop targeting at overseas Chinese students. Um, the purpose is really uh, to, we say, discover, train, and support overseas Chinese students who are socially mobile, uh, motivated, who wants to pursue uh, some social innovation uh, initiatives related to China. So we'll provide this training workshop to them. The purpose is to encourage social engagement social responsibility and philanthropy and support their social innovation. Um, it's going to be uh, uh, from August 19th to uh, 25th. It's a collaboration between Fei'an Xu Xu, a Harvard student organization here, that by uh, region, and also um, the China Society for Voluntary Research and Study Education uh, based on, uh, in Beijing Normal University uh, represented by Professor Zhang Qiang. So 